I felt like there was a way to get those moments that I loved from the graphic novel into a movie. A movie that was um, unusual and interesting and self-reflexive and I felt like that movie was in there. They claim their labors are to build a heaven, yet their heaven is populated with horrors. Perhaps the world is not made. Perhaps nothing is made. A clock without a craftsman. It's too late. Always has been. Always will be. Too late. When approaching Watchmen, I'm reminded of the film Adaptation, written by existentialist screenwriter Charlie Kaufman. The film is about existentialist screenwriter Charlie Kaufman failing to adapt the real-life book The Orchid Thief. Charlie struggles with the Hollywood system, artistic purity, and he gets screenplay advice from real-life speakers and a fictitious brother. While telling what little of the book he can actually adapt to film and occupying the rest of the film with his meta-screenplay about screenplays. I need to face this project head-on and, and God help you if you use voiceover in your work, my friends. God help you. It's flaccid, sloppy writing. Any idiot can write voiceover narration to explain the thoughts of a character. Adaptation is a movie about movies and should only be a movie. It shows what movies are capable of doing, like the fact that Charlie's world becomes action-packed and dramatic to comment on the exciting last act of a traditional screenplay. <laughs> Or the way Charlie describes the beginning of his screenplay is exactly how the film opens. We open on Charlie Kaufman, fat, old, bald, repulsive, sitting in a Hollywood restaurant across from Valerie Thomas, uh, a, a lovely, statuesque film executive. And maybe it shows the limitations of film, where he honestly can't find a way to make a movie about flowers. The, the book has no story. There's no story. All right, make one up. And has to pad it with other stuff, like fantasizing about the author. So what does this have to do with Watchmen? Well, the artist Dave Gibbons describes the graphic novel as a comic about comics. He sent me an item of memorabilia. It's a Tijuana Bible. It's a little eight-page porno comic they did in the 30s and 40s. The comic goes to great lengths to utilize storytelling devices that only comics can use. For instance, using still images to your advantage. In Chapter 11, a group of men are poisoned by Adrian Veidt. Except there's no motion to indicate that they're dead, leaving a surprise you're not looking for. An actor can act motionless, but Adrian would move, Bubastis would move, the fountain would move, so the illusion isn't the same. The comic is structured in a nine-panel grid that establishes a particular rhythm, so when that rhythm is broken, it's noticeable. In the chapter Fearful Symmetry, from start to back, the panels and compositions are mirrored, culminating in a triumphant double-page spread. And several characters are given unique speech bubbles that don't indicate their voice exactly, but a state of mind. For instance, when Rorschach speaks in flashbacks and without his mask, his bubble is normal. But the modern, deranged Rorschach speaks in jagged fashion. It's possible a film could portray this with inflections and voice. Not in it for the ink. But it's harder to withhold information. For instance, the identity of Hooded Justice is never revealed in the graphic novel. Hollis Mason wonders if it's a German bodybuilder who disappears around the same time, but nothing is confirmed. Looking to the speech bubble gives you no clues, for or against, no indication of an accent. But if a character has to speak on film, you, little bastard. you can't hide anything. But technicalities aside, a story is a story, right? Filmmakers should be able to take the themes, images, and characters and craft a story in a new medium. Zack Snyder has been hailed for his film adaptation of Watchmen, commended for his painstaking devotion to the source material, perfectly recreating the production design and transplanting dialogue resulting in a three and a half hour ultimate cut. But maybe it's hollower than appearances. I would only agree that a symbolic clock is as nourishing to the intellect as a photograph of oxygen to a drowning man. Like adaptation, some stories are more than just the events and are inseparable from the intended medium. Or as the author Alan Moore writes, the only point in transferring something to a medium for which it was not intended is to make more money, usually at the expense of the integrity of the work in question. So what is the artistic integrity of Watchmen? Well, first of all, the book isn't just a comic. At the end of each chapter, there's a section of prose, whether it's personal letters, psychological profiles, or excerpts from a book. To me, it's not about information, but reading written material from this world. The film makes references to Hollis Mason's book. You wrote that book. 
said some bad things about the comedian in it. But I don't get the same feeling as sitting down and reading a chapter from a fictional character. There's a kind of joy when reading an interview with Adrian Veidt and seeing laughs in brackets, a detail that only exists in print. Sure, an actor can laugh, if he chooses to, but even the placement, moments after he's killed millions of people, makes everything he says so powerful. Or little details like spelling errors in Rorschach's psychiatric report. Or safety lines in The New Frontiersman. The book imparts a collage, separate stories working together to create a whole, not unlike Dr. Manhattan's perception of time. A symbolic ability of comics is showing several images on one page. By looking around the page, you can look forward in time and backwards, but wherever you focus, you're reading in the present. Dr. Manhattan speaks about past and pending in present tense because it's all happening simultaneously. It is 1958 and I am graduating with a PhD in atomic physics. The cogs are falling. Zack Snyder capitalizes on iconic images from the comic, but ignores a lot of cinematic devices that Dave Gibbons uses. In The Birth of Dr. Manhattan, his backstory is framed around 10 seconds of dropping a photograph back and forth in time. I don't see how Zack Snyder resisted the urge to film something in slow motion and cut back to it every 30 seconds. Same for Lori and John's conversation on Mars, interspersed with a glimmering, spilling nostalgia bottle until the present finally catches up with the image. Lori finally discovers the comedian is her father and throws the bottle, nostalgia being quite a symbol for her memories rather than bashing the glass. <laughs> There's also a sequence where Rorschach walks around unmasked. To keep his identity secret, we're shown his point of view. I think it'd be interesting if there was a long, continuous take of GoPro footage and strangers would react to him as he walked by. And of course, there's the Black Freighter, a comic within a comic that symbolically mirrors Adrian's delusional superiority over humanity. Noble intentions had led me to atrocity. The righteous anger fueling my ingenious, awful scheme was but delusion. The film attempts to add several animated segments in the ultimate cut, and sometimes it works to give a moment of pause. But when it's divorced from the original context, the idea of a comic about comics, it suddenly seems random to sit through a bit of animation, especially when it disrupts the narrative. They don't interrupt the flow of the narrative because they don't have to, because you're going to do it. Exactly. It's, it's a choice you make. <laughs> it's a choice you make. Where if I had to do that, it's a clumsy tool for a filmmaker to have to like, at that point, you're in the middle of the most dramatic part of the movie, and you're like, oh wait, 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 let me just go back an and fill you in on why this is happening this way. See, the purpose is to be a commentary about comics. In a technical way, you can show a panel of the news vendor, then a panel of the comic, and back and forth, even using lettering over other panels to indicate the continuation of the Black Freighter. Thematically, it's about the history of comics. In Watchmen, real-life artists like Joe Orlando are mentioned, as well as companies like EC Comics and DC Comics. In a fictional article on the Black Freighter, the author says, In the final scenes, thanks to the interplay of text and pictures, we see that the Mariner, though he has escaped from his island, is in the end marooned from the rest of humanity in a much more terrible fashion. So what does Snyder gain by transplanting an idea from the book without the intended commentary? We did the Black Player sort of separately. I wanted to do it, but we didn't really design it to be intercut into the film, and so we had to kind of Jerry rig it in. Though it goes in pretty pretty nicely, I just I feel I I, I never felt like 100% that it was like you know completely organic. Could he have used different film styles that actually mean something? He could have played with aspect ratios to represent different time periods, like the Grand Budapest Hotel. The comic frames the first sex scene around Adrian Veidt doing acrobatics on television. And just look at the confidence as he leaps up and grabs the bar. It's all one smooth, seamless flow of motion. Uh, I can't seem to... The comic uses news footage of Dr. Manhattan, but the film doesn't. Sally Jupiter had a movie deal that fell apart, but the film chooses to reference the Tijuana Bible instead. The Black Freighter is at its basic, a commentary about how real life affects our media. In Watchmen, real life superhero comics like Superman exist, but they've fallen out of fashion because the Minutemen and eventually the Crime Busters actually exist, and readers don't want to read about real life. Which is why when Adrian says, I'm not a comic book villain, it doesn't quite work. The point of the original line is that, well, he is a comic book villain, more or less. He enacts a ridiculous Silver Age plot that actually works, so ridiculous that Dan doesn't believe him. And it's why I feel like Zack Snyder misunderstands Watchmen's commentary on superheroes. 
Alan Moore says, Watchmen certainly wasn't an attempt to reinvigorate a tired superhero genre. Quite the reverse. As with the previous Marvel Man, it was a critique of superheroes, and a meditation upon how these figures would look if they were disastrously transplanted to a realistically depicted, and above all, adult world for which they'd never been designed. Zack Snyder, through his visuals, his pacing, and his artistic choices, has adopted the perspective of Hollis Mason, who has a romanticized idea of superheroes. This is the left hook. Floored Captain Axis, remember? <laughs> See, the reality is that for anyone to decide to go out in the streets wearing a costume to beat up criminals, they are inherently weird. The book makes great efforts to satirize the glamour of superhero tropes. Dollar Bill's cape is caught in a revolving door and he's gunned down. Dan loses a criminal because he has to take a leak. Even the gaudy, wacky costumes are part of the point. They're meant to look stupid. Dan calls his goggles kitschy. When Silk Spectre saves the citizens in the tenement fire, somebody compares her outfit to pajamas and the way Dan and Rorschach race towards Adrian's vivarium on snow segways. It's cute. This is the point of Watchmen. Dressing up in costumes is silly. People have always said, like, superheroes are ridiculous, you know, like, like we would have people dress up in costumes, like, walking <laughs> around. And I'm like, really? You know, like, you look at that shot and you think, like, wow, I guess, you know, we accept the village people without really batting an eye. We accept, you know, Ziggy Stardust without, like, really <laughs> making, you know, a big, you know, it's just in our culture, so. I thought Superhero was not a very big reach after that. I actually love the Minutemen and their costumes in the context of satirizing superheroes because they look silly. But Snyder and his costume designer Michael Wilkinson view the Minutemen as antiquated. All these fantastically antiquated and wonderful costuming techniques that you usually try and stay far away from because this is the 21st century. And the second generation as a modern improvement and evolution. We really needed to be faithful to the original designs and time period, but I think we, we needed to address what my parents or my neighbors knew about superheroes and what they expected and sort of that iconology of what a superhero is. These costumes are gorgeous, but by making them look cool, making them look sexy, making them look badass, it defeats the purpose of making them look pathetic. I mean, this is a book that features a right-wing article that minimizes the Ku Klux Klan when compared to superheroes. A book that shows Adrian's inability to make a toy line of villains without slipping an army of costume terrorists into a Saturday morning cartoon show. Sported unironically when half the prison attacks Silk Spectre and Night Owl. This is Zack Snyder's handicap. He can't help himself. It has to look cool, it has to look epic, and it does. His Rorschach is a renegade, his Night Owl glides elegantly, and his slow motion is transcendental. But it's a detriment. First of all, slow motion, well, slows the movie down. With any adaptation, time is precious. There's a lot of material, and even at three and a half hours, the film is still missing important dialogue-driven scenes. Sacrifice to lengthy action segments, bad sex scenes, or painfully slow transitions, often set to music. So in this scene, Zack Snyder is forced to use extended shots that match the music, but we're not learning anything new about the characters or the situation. I've re-edited this scene, and I was able to shave 40 seconds off the runtime, and I think it actually improves the pacing. You know I can't. So you call Dan, which is only natural. You deserve the comfort of an old friend. And other than padding the movie, slow motion glorifies the characters. Slow motion looks cool. People punch in slow motion, people jump and dive in slow motion, and it almost makes it look like they have superpowers. They don't. I saw the movie before I read the comic, and I wondered at the time, what are their superpowers? Because they punch through walls, they do aerobatic flips and jumps, they get shot at without being hit, and Adrian catches a bullet without explanation. Which is why I don't see Zack Snyder's version as a realistic superhero movie as it's often described. To me, realistic doesn't mean butchering someone violently, graphically, brutally, but showing how pathetic superheroes really are in the face of that violence. Our perspective of superheroes is informed by Rorschach's perspective. Why are so few of us left active, healthy, and without personality disorders? He shames the people that gave up while being the coolest character in the movie. You can tell Zack Snyder loves Rorschach. 
By what the film conveys, these are all well-intentioned characters that never got their chance. Well, my point is that we had it too easy. It wasn't fair what happened to you guys. You guys who picked up where we left off with Nixon forcing you out. And the ones that gave up. You quit. Or drank themselves into retirement are the pathetic ones. Margarita? Think about the opening. Does the comedian get savagely beaten? Or is it a glamorized fight where the comedian goes out like a champion? Edward Blake, 67 years old. 6'2", a solid 225. This guy was built like a linebacker. Yeah, I saw the body. For a guy his age, he was in terrific shape. You mean apart from being dead? That's plate glass. You have to step on the gas just to put a crack in it. That'd have been thrown. By structuring the scene this way, I've eliminated three and a half minutes. The scene with the cops is more engaging, it's more faithful to the book, and it suits the theme better of a sad old man beaten to death without a single moment of triumph. I'd compare the film to something like Eyes Wide Shut, where everything is slick and hypnotic. And I'd compare the book to a parody featured in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. What the hell is this place? What did you bring me to? This is a buffet. Well, buddy. I can see that it's a buffet, but why is there a buffet at a goddamn orgy, Frank? Well, you don't want to bang on an empty stomach, do you? I don't want to bang any of these people anyway. They're all paunchy and weird and old. You can't tell under the mask. I can absolutely tell. The other major aspect of the book is the approaching nuclear holocaust. The film tackles a lot of the broad strokes pretty well. There's impending doom, crippling fear, but it misses a subtle quality of the book, numbness. There's a certain attitude reminiscent of Slaughterhouse-Five, where the lead, Billy Pilgrim, is unstuck in time. Having this objective view on reality, to see the beginnings and endings of everything, it makes him shrug in the face of death and decay. Every time someone dies, Billy Pilgrim says, so it goes. It sounds a lot like Dr. Manhattan. But the everyday citizens do this too. There's every warning in the world about the apocalypse, but even when things get bad, there's still an assumption that the world will still be here. That if we survived Hiroshima, we can survive anything. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. After World War II, we healed and limped forward, and there are reminders of where we've been. Graffitied in an alley is a couple embracing, silhouetted, and it reminds Dr. Malcolm of the aftermath of Hiroshima, where shadows were left behind. But despite that, the colors are bright, passion is promoted, and Adrian builds a vivarium in the middle of a frozen wasteland. The film looks primed for war. It's dark, moody, rainy, and everyone looks miserable. It's a dark movie. So you see some of these sets and you know, they're lit really dark. There's that edge where you're keeping the sets really dark but you still want to show off how amazing they are. But life looks like it goes on until it doesn't. Even if I wanted to help, my future is blocked some kind of temporal interference. I cannot see it clearly. Interference? Caused by what? In all likelihood, nuclear holocaust. If the United States and Soviet Union engage in all-out war, the resulting blast wave would produce a sudden burst of tachyons, particles which travel backward through what you perceive as time. Therefore, I'm securing my vision. So then if Watchmen isn't a faithful adaptation in spirit, does it work on its own? In a lot of ways, yes. It's competent and well-assembled. I'd argue the film makes some improvements on the book, mostly to the ending. Rorschach's death is more emotional. As is Hollis Mason's. I love that Dan gets to have an emotional breakdown instead of immediately compromising. You haven't idealized mankind, but you've, you've deformed it. You've mutilated it. That's your legacy. And part of the book I don't think works is having Dan and Lori immediately having sex in order to cope with Adrian's atrocities. Walking away and living out their lives is a much better fit. I also appreciate Sally Jupiter's hair. This is one instance where being aesthetically pleasing works in favor of the character. The original Silk Spectre saw the commercial benefits of heroism, and used crime fighting to launch her modeling career, so it makes sense that she looks better. Everything else tends to work by virtue of copying the original work. The film has meaning. 
The political alignment of the characters is clear. The right, the left, and true neutral. Dan's impotence is directly tied to his alter ego. Laurie righteously advocates for justice, both personally and globally, though it's watered down. And the morality of superheroes is perfectly called into question through the comedian, rivaling that of any criminal. However, I can't say this movie works on its own, and I don't think it works for a general audience either. Other than being a little weird, we're presented with a lot of material that only exists because it was in the comic. But by changing one aspect or leaving something unexplained, it doesn't make any internal sense. The obvious example is Bubastis, the genetically modified Lynx, with no explanation as to why it's there. A subtle example is John's last name, didn't kill Osterman, said only once and in the third person. So how would an unfamiliar audience know who he's talking about? We're presented with an alternate 1985, made possible by Dr. Manhattan rapidly accelerating technological growth. With it comes electric cars and massive blimps, featured in the film, but again, with no explanation. And it's contradictory to the film's logic. See, Adrian and John are still working towards solving the energy crisis, which is why the only electric car is seen at the end of the film. So why does Hollis Mason's sign say he specializes in obsolete models? Also missing are the e-cigarettes. They're fairly insignificant, except Lori has to accidentally press the flamethrower button. In the comic, she's looking for a dash light. In the movie, she just presses the button for no reason, which makes her look like an idiot. And morally, Zack Snyder includes every part of the book that could be homophobic. Possible homosexual. Must investigate further. Hey, a police officer, you fucking faggot! But leaves out all the gay positive material that could counterbalance it or reasons why someone is being homophobic. The woman in the riot says that because superheroes are viewed as psychosexual deviants, which is easier to understand when the comedian is wearing a bondage mask. My point can be summed up in one scene. Adrian, John, and Dan attend the comedian's funeral, and they each have their own flashback, but in the film, the order of the flashbacks is different, which is a perfectly acceptable change. It's even chronological now. But they didn't change the order of the characters to match. See, blocking isn't arbitrary. The way they stand is a part of visual storytelling, going down the line in order. By making a change, but not restructuring your own scene to suit your storytelling devices, you're just parroting someone else without understanding why. And that's what Zack Snyder has made, a hollow mimicking facade that accidentally imparts meaning by adapting a book with meaning, but it has no intelligence underneath, leaving a film that frustrates fans and alienates a general audience. However, like Sally's relationship to Edward Blake, I should have every reason to hate the Watchmen film, but I don't. You asked me why I wasn't mad at him. Because he gave 